Hi, and welcome to Stats with Mia. In this video, I'll try to give you an intuition behind statistical hypothesis tests. If you've come across this topic before, you'll know that it involves things like setting up a null and alternative hypothesis, calculating a test statistic, finding a critical value or a p-value, and making a conclusion about the test. It's a lot of new concepts to get used to, but I'm sure you'll be able to get a grasp of this because the type of reasoning that goes on behind hypothesis testing is something that you do all the time. For example, let's say that you're not feeling very well and you think you might be coming down with something. You think you might have fever, so to examine this you set up the null hypothesis, which is that you're healthy, there's nothing unexpected, and you do not have fever. The alternative hypothesis is that you do have fever. Now you go out and you get a thermometer and you check your temperature. This is sort of like your test statistic. And you see that you've got a temperature of 39 degrees. Now you need to compare this with the critical value for body temperature which is that anything above, say, 37.6 degrees is a fever. So you see that your temperature exceeds the critical value, and you conclude that you have a fever. So you can frame everyday decisions as if they are a hypothesis test. Now, in a statistical hypothesis test, the difference is that you're generally interested in a population and not just one person. Maybe you have a population of people who don't feel well and you want to see if on average they have a fever. So maybe you set up your hypothesis so that the null hypothesis is that the mean body temperature is below 37.6 in this population and the alternative is that it is above. This is a one-sided test, and uh, we would need to do a t-test to make a conclusion. Now, you're not able to go out and get data about every single one of these people in the population, so you get a randomly selected sample, and based on the sample you want to test this hypothesis, do you have evidence to reject the null hypothesis, say, at the 5% level? Now, in order to answer this question, you have to calculate a t-test statistic. You look at the mean of your sample. You see how far away it is from 37.6, the value in your hypothesis. And this is a measure of the signal. You then have to take into account the variability of the data. So you divide by the standard error here, which is the standard deviation of your sample divided by the square root of the sample size. So this is kind of a measure of noise. So the t-test statistic, it is a ratio of signal to noise. And it's a really special type of ratio because we actually know what distribution to expect of this statistic under the null hypothesis. So what does that mean? In this hypothetical world where the population mean is less than 37.6, we expect this test statistic to have a t distribution with degrees of freedom n minus 1. And you can split up this distribution into two areas. So you can split it up so that there's 95% of the area under this curve on the left-hand side and 5% on the right-hand side. And the 5% is what we call the rejection region in this one-sided test. If your test statistic, the one that you calculate here, is in this 5%, then that means that you have evidence to show that your data is really inconsistent with the null hypothesis, so you have evidence to reject it. The critical value right here, the 95th percentile of the t distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom, 
this is the line here that tells you where that cutoff point is. So you can conclude that if your test statistic is in this region, you would fail to reject the null hypothesis. And if it is in this 5% region, you would reject the null hypothesis. So the process that we go through is not that different from that first process we looked at, where we tried to determine whether you had a fever. Now you may find the way that we set up the hypothesis to be a little bit strange. In a sense, it seems like it's all about rejection. We either have evidence to reject the null, or we fail to reject the null. Why do we focus so much on rejecting hypotheses? rather than accepting them. Well, this is something to do with logic. It is easier to come up with a counterexample or some evidence that shows that a general statement is not true, rather than trying to show that a statement is true all the time. A classic example is if you want to prove that all swans are white, you'd have to go out and you'd have to check every single swan out there to see if it's white. However, in order to reject this statement, all you have to do is find one black swan and you're done. In our example, it's a bit more subtle. Our null hypothesis is that the mean of the population is less than 37.6. And we have a sample and we take their temperatures and we want to know when do we have sufficient evidence to reject the statement. Well, this all depends on the test statistic and the critical value. Let's say you collect data on 100 of these people in your population who are not feeling well and you see what their body temperature is and the distribution of these temperatures looks something like this. So most of them have a temperature in this region between 36 and 37. Would you have evidence to reject the null hypothesis here? Obviously not, because it doesn't look like there's even one person who has a temperature above 37.6. How about in this distribution? Well, clearly there are some people who have a fever in this, in this sample. Or how about in this example? It looks like more than half of the people have fever. How do you know when there's enough? Okay, so let's take a look at this last example here. In this example, we've got that the sample size is 100. The mean of this distribution right here is 38. And the standard deviation is 4. So let's calculate the test statistic. We would get um, x bar which is 38 minus the value in our hypothesis divided by the standard deviation over the square root of the sample size. And if you work this out, you'll get the answer is 1. This is our test statistic. Now, what values of this test statistic do you expect under the null hypothesis in the hypothetical situation where the mean of the population is less than 37.6? Well, we'd expect them to have a t distribution with degree of freedom 99 and minus 1. And since we have a 5% significance level on this test, and it's a one sided test, that means our critical region lies on the right hand side so that the area under this curve is 5% of the total area. And it turns out that the critical value right here is 1.66. Now our test statistic lies here. Its value is 1, so we are not in the rejection region and we fail to reject the null hypothesis. That's our conclusion of this hypothesis test.
An alternative approach that you might have heard of is to use the p-value. The p-value is the probability that you would get a test statistic that's at least as extreme as the one you observed under the null hypothesis. A p-value that is less than the significance level of your test, so in our case 5%, would mean that you reject the null hypothesis. Under the null hypothesis, we expect the test statistic to have this distribution, right? The t distribution with 99 degrees of freedom. And the test statistic we actually observe is 1. So the p-value is the probability of seeing a value that is 1 or even greater. So it's this whole area right here. And the p-value here, this area, is 0 0.1598. This is a value that is bigger than the 5% threshold that we set for our hypothesis test. So we would fail to reject the null hypothesis here. Now, we focused here on a one-sided t-test for a single population but there's lots of different statistical tests out there. Some other common ones are a two-sided test, where, for example, you might want to test whether the mean temperature of a population is 36 degrees, and you'd reject if you had enough evidence on either side of that. So in this case, your critical region would be split between the two tails of the distribution instead of all being on that single tail like we had in the previous example. You might have measurements on uh, people before and after an event or intervention. So that means that you have repeated measurements on a particular population. In this case, you would use a paired t-test. Or you may have to independent groups of people and you want to compare their means. In this case, you would have a t-test on two populations. And finally, you might want to compare the variances of two populations in an f-test. Now, if you understand the principles of hypothesis testing from a bird's eye view, you're well on your way to understanding how all of these different procedures work. And these are the kinds of tests that help us understand if a new drug is better than a current one, or if a certain group of people are more susceptible to disease than another, or whether a policy is having an impact. So statistical hypothesis testing is a really important subject. Thanks for tuning in.